Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic. We got Patrick Kane, former head coach at Hermitage High School from 2001 to 2017. And he's going to be talking about his spread offense. Coach, thanks for coming on. Appreciate you, my friend. Boss. Yes, sir. So good to me. So it's your show, Coach. All right. Well, uh, it kind of evolved. Uh, we were just doing the read with the quarterback pull and then play a team in the playoffs, and they kind of figured out how to handle that, and then we incorporated it to the bubble being the triple aspect of it. Um, if you know much about triple option, it's about a five-yard pitch. The bubble, it can be a 15-yard pitch. So it really widens the field. The advantage is it forces the defense to cover sideline to sideline. Uh, so it really stretches out the defense, and then you can hit them where you want to, right up the middle with the inside zone. Um, and it's a pure quarterback read all the way across. Um, I see, most teams I've seen doing it, I don't really believe they're truly reading it. Most of the bubble aspect is, is like a post read, uh, post RPO, I mean, pre, pre snap RPO, but we're post snap RPO. We're reading as we go, just like the Noel Wishbone triple offense. We're reading as we go. Uh, and it really, the bubble aspect forces it to cover the entire field. Uh, the most important thing is teaching the quarterback how to do the read. Uh, so what I'm going to do, draw up here, is how we would set up the practice to teach the quarterbacks how to do the read. So I'm going to draw it up here first real quick. So... I would. I was in charge of quarterbacks, so I would force the quarterback read. So I would be the defensive end. That's our first read. We have another coach, coach number two, uh, who is usually our running backs coach. He would be the flat defender, which is our second read. And our third coach over here was our wide receiver coach, working on the stock block to so get the bubble behind him. So three coaches there. We don't want players doing it because players aren't coaches. They don't understand what you're trying to get out of the drill. It becomes a competition. I'm trying to trick you, and that's all bullshit. Uh, you, we're trying to develop the correct reads. So I would be the defensive end. If the defensive end comes, and if I come flat down the line, that means the qu quarterback is a pull read. If the defensive end comes straight at the quarterback, uh, that's a give read. If in doubt, we give the ball. That's what we tell the quarterback. If you're not sure, if it's, if it's sketchy to you, give. Give the ball. And the philosophy behind that was, if I give the ball, it may be zero gain, maybe a half yard loss, whatever. But if the quarterback keeps it, it's going to be a four yard loss because that quarterback's four yards off the ball. So that's the first read is he just read it and make it plain and simple. You're not trying to trick the quarterback. You just make it simple. You're trying to build his confidence in, in whether it's pull or give. So I would either run flat down the line or I run immediately at the quarterback. Those are his two reads. Decide if I'm pulling or giving we work on that drill first. I don't need anybody else there. We would work on that first, that aspect first, uh, when you're first implementing this. Then the second aspect is to have the full triple going on here. Okay? So if he gets flat down the line and we get a pull read, then his next eyes are on the flat defender. If the flat defender is squared up to him, staring him down on him, that means we have two on one on our bubble here. So we like those numbers. So, so if he's eyeballing him on the second read, then he's throwing the bubble. If he has attacked the bubble, that's when the quarterback keeps and he runs the alley, like the old buck sweep. We don't want, don't want the quarterback running wide. If he runs wide, he's running over here where the bad guys are. Okay, The reason why he didn't throw the bubbles is because uh, they all flew to the bubble. So then he's running the alley like the old buck sweep alley. He's he's running north or south. Once he replaces the defensive end, he's going north with the with the ball, and it's a run. If the guy's stalking him, we're throwing the bubble. The key thing on the receivers is when you're in the bubble, we want it, we want you behind the, the outside receiver when you catch the ball. Then your job is to run to, for a five yard gain to the sideline. There is no cut option. You are not looking to cut back at all. You cannot do that. Even if you score a freaking touchdown, you're wrong. Your job is to get five yards to the sideline. Once you've made a five-yard gain on the sideline, then you can cut back all you want. Because our main purpose is we are trying to threaten the entire width of the field. 
We don't want guys trying to be heroes because more times than not, they're going to try and cut back and they'll be wrong more times than they're right. Stretch the field, stretch the field, because, again, once you start stretching the field, then our inside zone is going to get taken to the house. Okay, because they're going to be trying to cover the whole field and we can go north-south where we really want to do, give them the running back the ball. So that's the general philosophy of the bubble, and we're trying to, and trying to uh, attack the entire width of the field with the bubble, which there aren't very many plays that can do that. The key thing I found is you stare at the quarterback. You are the quarterback coach. Your dudes reads. You can be eyes to eyes. When they first doing this, they're going to want to look back to the running back. You can't. You're making your read on the defense end. The quarterback's eyes has to be on the end. It is the running back's responsibility to make the mesh uh, for the ball, not the quarterback's. The quarterback wants to reach back deep like the old zone, uh, like the old wishbone zone, reaching back deep for the ball. It gives him more time to make his read, but it's a running back's job to make the mesh. Because the quarterback has to really have his eyes on the ball. The bigger problem you have with running backs early on is they want to go too fast. Okay, we're, I'm a pistol. I'll, I think it's best under pistol. Offset the back, then you know which way the zone's going. So at a pistol, nobody knows. It keeps everybody guessing which way it's going to go. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan of offsetting uh, the back uh, to run this. I'm a, I'm a strong believer in doing it at a pistol so you don't give me any pre-snap keys of what's going on. You can't get defense linemen slanting certain directions to try and take advantage of that. Uh, so the key thing with the running back here is we're snapping the ball four yards. If he goes on snap, he's by the quarterback. There's no read. It's too fast. So he has to delay. Every running back's different. Uh, I let my co- running back coach tinker with the guy, whatever he works best. Some guys want to stand there until he sees it caught. Uh, some guys will take a false step, whatever, to the delay him. Whatever it works, you want to delay him. Um, so that the time is right. The worst thing he can do is be too fast. He's slow-mo until he's got the ball in his hands. Because uh, if he goes by him, he can't make a read. So you got to slow down the running backs. they got to be patient. The depth here behind the quarterback, again, depends on your running back. Whatever works, we get that mesh right. Uh, it's not a big deal. Um, the running back on the inside zone, we're zones, pure zone team. We would read the inside foot of the play side guard. So for me, this would be 33 zone. 33 zone. The zone's going left. The bubble action is going right. So to me, this would be 33 zone, reading the inside heel of the guard and the running uh, the running back is uh, to make his cut. So if we're going against, let's say we're going against the 4-3, got a D tackle backer, they're comboing here. These two got these two. The most important thing the running back do is the earlier he makes his cut, the more wrong he is. He needs to run up the ass of the guard. Why? Because that will suck this linebacker up here and make this combo easier uh, or more efficient to do. The sooner he makes his cut, the sooner this linebacker is coming off and makes it harder for the combo. So the running back needs to get up to the ass of the guard, get as tight as he can, suck this guy in to get this combo going, and then he can make his cut according to how the block goes, whichever way it goes. But the t- he needs to be tight to the guard's ass before he makes his cut to bring that linebacker to the play. So this combo can work more efficiently. Um, running backs want to make their cut too soon, and, and it makes it easier on the linebacker and harder on our our, our combo here on the zone. Um, that's pretty much it uh, from the zone. We would call that 33 with the bubble, and it's a read all the way across. Um, I was always of the philosophy, you should better call this play every play and just run up and down the side of the field because very t- few teams can defend all three from making the right reads. It's three plays in one. Um, there are a lot of things you can do off of that. Uh, I'm a fan of make this the single receiver side. Trips over here. And then motion and run it. Get the guy on the run. Um, if you're running motion with it, the quarterback has to be patient. He has to let the guy get way out here before he snaps the ball. Uh, if he snaps it too early, the, the bubble won't be stacked behind uh, the one receiver side. Um, it forces teams – this. I prefer to do trips to the short side, single receiver to the wide side, and you're really stretching it. Um, in order to do all this, the bubble is a huge part of it. Some people think the bubble is hard to throw. Uh, it's just like anything else. you got to practice it. So when we warm up, after the quarterbacks get their arm warm, the first thing we do is we throw bubbles. Uh, I like the Gilman Nets. Uh, they got those three pocket nets that are diagonal, and we would throw at the middle pocket uh, for the right le- length for our warm up. 
If this is the sideline, I would have the Gilman net on the sideline. If you can see where I'm Gilman net on the sideline. Okay. And this is the hash. We would start, we'd throw one here. When you're first doing, I would throw three here. Move about five yards or three more, get about middle of the field, throw three more. To get you different distances, you're gonna be throwing your bubble. If you're on the short side of the field, throwing a bubble is different from throwing from the opposite hash. And it's gonna change every time because again, we're trying to get this two on one on this sideline when we throw it. So the depth of your bubble, your distance of your bubble is gonna be different with every throw. So we would, in warm-ups, we would throw the short one, mid-range one, and the long one, three. And then as they're getting good and you're going through the season, we would throw one here, move throw one here, throw one here as part of our warm-up routine in the, in the morning. Then you flip it, throw it the other way, so you throw them both right and left. You just face the other way, the net's right there, and you throw them to the net. I would put the net actually on the sideline just for an aiming point. Uh, all right, a couple of things I want to re-emphasize here or, or emphasize that I messed up on. On this mesh here, the quarterback needs to sidestep the player in the middle uh, for the back's path. You don't want to force the back wide to come back here. So the quarterback's first step is, is side step to the left and then open his hips, reading the defensive end, so he clears the area for the back. Um, the coach right here, again, I'm the quarterback coach, so I'm here working on the read flat, pull, give read. We're not trying to trick the quarterback. We're trying to make it easy reads. All we're doing is building confidence and building reps. Uh, so don't, you're not trying to trick, it, trick them, either run directly at the quarterback or run directly at the line. And I did those drills because I'm trying to build the quarterback, and I could see his eyes every time and make sure his eyes are on me. Um, this coach was our running back coach most of the time, the flat defender. Again, he's trying to do the same thing. Immediately on the snap, he's either going to run to the bubble or he can basically stand there or act like he's stalking the quarterback. So here's an easy read of whether to throw the bubble or not. And then here – this is what makes the offense go. Outside of shoes, got to be a block. He's got to be a good block, and you want to time it up. You don't want to do it too early because it takes a while for the bubble to get there. Uh, so you want to stalk block and get the block. So that's why this coach would be here working on the stalk block with this receiver. So we got great blocking on the edge. And when he catches the ball, he's getting five yards to the sideline. So I can't emphasize enough, these need to be coaches. Okay, If you're dealing with players, you're not going to get a good enough look. Um, this is how this drill was set up, and we would do it right before seven on seven because they had those people for seven on seven. Then we go into our seven on seven aspect. It takes five minutes to do this, maybe ten minutes to do this drill when you're rotating people through, and you want to incorporate your different motions and everything else we talked about before, um, and then the different depths that you're doing it, uh, widths of the field. I guess I should say, getting across the field. Um, this, if you want to do this offense, this is a daily deal that you got to work on with the reads. There are so many different aspects you can do to it formation-wise. Um, I was a big believer in a no tight ends on this because I'm a former O-line guy. Uh, every time you put a tight end here, you change this guy's rules completely. Um, and then you put them up. So I got to know without a tight end, and we don't want to confuse these guys. They got all the work to do. So I was a big fan of no tight end. I do see a lot of value in having what we call the H back there because you can move him, motion him, do a lot of things with him just like you would a tight end. That was my preference. I didn't want to run it with a tight end because uh, I don't want to screw with these guys' rules and haven't learned twice as much. Um, Simplify it for them because they got to do all the work. So that's just a two cents on mine on that aspect. Um, formation wise, I, I was a big believer in a lot of motion to throw the bubbles because that really screws with defenses. Uh, and we do a lot of jet sweep stuff, all of that, and different things you can do off the motion play. So I was a big believer in motion and shifting uh, formations to take advantage uh, of the defense. Uh, but the main purpose of this was to cover sideline, sideline. And it, this is the key point. Wide receiver catches the bubble. He has to get five-yard gain on the sideline before he can cut. Because our main purpose of this is to threaten the field, the width of the field, for the defense field. they got to cover the width so we can hit the zone uh, with our running back up the middle because they're trying to cover sideline we have a bigger chance of hitting it north-south. Um, so that's in a nutshell. Now, we would throw the bubble as a straight play. We would, in my offense, we called that 302, but he just catch throwing the bubble. Uh, so that was a part of it, because if you're giving me the bubble from the get-go, and I want, I want him to throw the bubble, I had an opportunity to call the bubble, and we would just say 302, which is a pass play, we're throwing the bubble now. Um, and, and we would do that. When we did that, we turn and go, the back would always go opposite of the bubble because we didn't want him throw, going through the window of the quarterback trying to throw the ball. We also had a, a drill, part of the drill when you get advances, 
Some teams may want to creep this guy up and blitz him, take away the run, take away the quarterback with the blitz, and that would be a hot call, which means hot, 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 and now we're just throwing the ball right now because you're giving us the ball. So if you want the outside, the black backers start creeping up on the blitz, and we can see that uh, during the cadence or during the play. Only people have to know it is these two because they're already running the bubble. So the quarterback would just tell the running back, hot, 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 which means get out of my way. I'm throwing the bubble right now. If they were coming with outside blitz uh, to take it, try and uh, blow this up right here. That's pretty much it, Troy. The the, the, the bubble aspect is on. I, honestly, I don't know if anybody truly read it in the region like we were doing it. Um, but you got to put in the time. You got to work on the bubble aspect every day with the quarterbacks. And then you got to work on this drill every day, just like the old wishbone. They got to work on that triple reads. Same deal here. You got some questions about some stuff? Yeah, seven? quick game. You go over it in your entire quick game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we would call it 300, but I mean, it was just snapping to direct snap because we're already dropped out of the pistol. Uh, quarterback, back. So we would call it 300, it means catch and throw. Um, and if three on one, maybe all hitches. So I'll just do it in a flex. So we're running the five yard hitch. I would call that three on one. Uh, one is just a name of the play. I didn't really mean anything. Everybody's got these passing trees up. We didn't do any passing trees. This was the package. Three on one's all hitch. I mean, it's catch and throw. And it's a pre snap read. Whoever's a soft defender, we're throwing the ball to them. Uh, if it's press, it's a no go. We automatically check to a fade on the outside. If we get press coverage, we know we can't throw the hitch. Um, so we're throwing automatic throwing a fake. I would teach my quarterbacks, uh, if we ever got – if we're in trips formation and we're one-on-one -on -one over here and you got press, we better be throwing a fade over here on them. It's just pre-snap read. I don't care what play I got called. Third and one, I don't give a crap. If we got press coverage right here and we got a monster over here, now obviously personnel will dictate that, but we got our dude over here and we had a few dudes in our program and they want to go press one-on-one, -on -one, we're throwing a fade right now. It's just a jump ball and I the quarterback had the right to do that. Any play, any situation, any time, he could check. So, of course, you got to teach your quarterbacks when to do it, how to do it, what you're looking for to do it. You know, if, he's, if you're coaching up and these guys do a fake press and, and sink on you, uh, you have to know that and put it in and let them know, hey, these team does that a lot. we got to make sure we're down going right. He's he's pressing on me and he's not going to be sinking and going into his own coverage on Um Did have too many team, teams that were that sophisticated that did that. They're more worried about all the zone stuff we're doing than worry about uh, that. Um, so I believe in teaching the quarterbacks when to make the read and then let them make the read. You know, are they going to be right 100% of the time? No, but they're going to be right a lot more than, than your play call is going to be. That means you got to be a teacher. You got to teach them how to do this and what they're looking for, when to do it, and then they got to build the confidence in them to do it. Um, so three hundred one would be just our hitches. Slant to us is three hundred three. I mean, it's nothing, nothing special in it. Uh, if we're doing out of flex, you know, just slant, and we would do it off our bubble action because we do so much bubble. We want this read because then this guy starts running with the bubble and opens our window for our slant. So that would just be our slant. It's at 300. Uh, and then the other one is just our, our 309, which is our fade deal. We like to do that out of trips. Uh, so we got a fade here. And we got a fade here. And um, we, we would press into the inside and get a hit shear read. So first, our pre-snap read was, do we have a fade? We got press coverage, we're throwing the fade, yes. If it's not, then we're reading the flat defender right here. Uh, if he stays here, we're throwing the flat. If he goes to the flat, we're throwing the, uh, kind of like a hitch, I don't know what you call that, slant a little more to the inside there. Um, very basic, simple stuff uh, for our, our 300 package. Um, and that was our quick game, and that was our bread and butter. We, I would really work on the quarterback catch throw uh, because teams would want to blitz us. And I remember we had, we had one team that was really coming hard, and we knew we couldn't block him. But, but he can't get to him before he can catch throw. It makes a good pre snap read, make a decision where he's going. He's throwing the hitch right now, uh, or he's throwing the fade right now. He can catch throw, and you can cut those blitzes down. You throw that early, you throw your hitches or your fades early against the team that wants to blitz the hell out of you, um, they stop blitzing. And then you can go to all your other stuff and buy your time. But you have to make a quarterback – 
make a pre-snap read and catch throw and get the ball out quick, and that kind of slows that stuff down. Also, with the blitzing, the, the motion helps a lot. Cut that out. And all these, uh, our slant game and this game, we can motion to our 309 here to make go from flex to trips to get that that pressure on the sideline. Um, motion helps with the, with the people trying to blitz you too. How about drop that game? Quarterback three step drop and gun. So that would we would call 500. Uh, You know, you guys are four verts, which would be our well, what I call five ten, and um, this is basically your four verts. Okay. So pre snap read. If we got we got the go route, then you take it, um, and then if post snap, if that's not it, if we got uh, like a cover two situation. All right, turn on my quarterback. If I had a right-hand quarterback, my bender would be on the right. So he'd be my bender, and he'd run straight. And he'd be quick three, what I, I call a quick three, which is dance one, two, three, ball out. Um, and we're hitting the skinny post right here underneath. Um, if it was a true, if we're hitting the go route, it'd be a true three and a hitch, big three hitch to throw the outside one. But if we preach that read, we decide that's dead. We don't like that. We're hitting here. That would be our splitter. If you got one safety in the middle, then obviously you do your, your true four verts if you got one safety in the middle. And again, it's one, two, three balls out quick, trying to hit in that open and hole. Uh, he cannot hold this inside one. When you hold it, you're getting closer to the middle safety or whoever, and then it's long. So it's got to be out of a quick three step, get the ball out, throwing a bullet here, uh, hitting them in the seams on the inside. And that was, we threw this probably 90% of the time as opposed to the outside one. Um, because I think it's more difficult to defend. Because um, most guys would be soft on the outside for us. We didn't, we didn't get too much press because of our throwing our fades. Uh, if you do press, quarterback check you and throw the fade, and they just quit doing it. Um, that's five tens, four verts. Um, one of my favorite plays was f we call it five thirty six, and we would call it three just because this is like a play action. Uh, where we're hitting the post to the trip receiver side. If we had a quick turnover midfield, I'm probably calling 536. Okay. We're, we're running a post here. Um, if there's a middle safety, the in number two is told to run right at his feet. Because uh, we want to occupy him so we can throw over top here. And this guy's running a wheel. We would buy some time to come inside and then come out. And he's supposed to slow play down the sideline so he's not getting on top of this. So we're trying to double isolate this guy, high low him. I don't care about this corner over here. This guy, this receiver's job is to beat him. Okay, if he's trying to cover all the way over here, you see we're going to have a problem here. So uh, we don't read him. All we do, our eyes are on him. And my quarterback, we're faking zone here, faking zone, three step, drop, and our eyes are on him. If the safety is square to him, he is throwing it. He's not looking at the receiver. He's just looking at him, and his job is to throw the ball thirty five yards. On the hash. So this guy has a spot he's going to. He knows the ball is coming to him 35 yards in the hash. So he has a spot he's running to, and he has a spot he's throwing to. And we're just reading him. If his hips are square, he's not bailing like a madman. Seven on seven, he can never do this because all these guys just bail like crazy. So you can never practice on seven on seven because there's no run action, there's no nothing. But in real ball, uh, this guy's our read. And 90% of the time, his hips are square because this guy's bailing, sprinting right at him. He's staying. We're throwing the post. And if it's on the money, it's a big play for us. Um, and for some reason, if the corner has bailed, then I'll tell, and this is the coach report, he's, that's all he's reading. He doesn't know what's going on over here. So we would come back and say, hey, hit the wheel. 536, check the wheel. So then he'll look and he'll see that the corner's sinking here, and we'll throw it here. And the key thing here is you want to slow down about 10 yards and kind of slow down as he's going because he don't want to get here. The deeper you throw the wheel, the corner can come off over top of it. Um, so he would slow play it on the sidelines and kind of wait for his opportunity. And uh, then we'd hit that uh, later in the game. But we like out of trips, we can do it out of flex and motion to get the trips there uh, and get that same look uh, just to get the motion going a lot um, with the motion with the bubble and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But that was probably my one of my favorite plays. Um, normal smash route, which we would call 508. Uh, 
No, I'm sorry. We would we did it two different ways. Uh, I like to just bet directly out of the hitch here, hitch here, and I'll, and we're reading this corner. Um, if the corner stays on the hitch, then we're throwing the corner out. If he sinks, then we're throwing the hitch. Um, three step drop. Again, high low action. We're high low in this corner, making it make a decision. Great end zone area play. Um, point of reference to this guy, we want to really stretch this guy. So we always told him wherever he is on the field, his aiming point is the front, is the back corner of the end zone. Uh, so we're getting a lot more stretch here. We can always bend him to the ball where the quarterback throws him open. Uh, but that was the aiming point here, so we don't get it cut too short, and this guy can cover both. Um, so he's reading the corner, three steps, throwing the hitch. Only thing you got to be careful about, um, it's better at, uh, better at a trips. I like a uh, trips a lot because then you got your skinny post going on right here as well if you want it. Uh, but for the red zone, can't beat it. I'm a big fan of the hitch, just getting more space, more separation. You bring them in, then your flat defender has a chance to get on top of it. So I was a fan of the hitch. Uh, on the five way, which is a lot of people call smash. Um, 507 to us would be like a double post where you got your post action going there, and then you got your crossers coming here, getting your mesh in the middle. Big play off of this was we would then call flash. Flash to me would be my back. If her back catches the ball well, get her onto the flat and end up being a wheel. Here, very tough to cover. Got a big play when we, uh, I had called 507. It was two minute drive to win the game um, uh, against Holland Springs in a, in, a, in a playoff game early on in my career. And Juju was our quarterback. And he saw, I called 507, two minute offense. Good thing about this offense is they yell out seven. And they know what the play is. And they line up and they're running it. And Juju felt the flash was open, so he turned to the running back and said, run flash. And he ran the flash and hit him for a, a big play that took us down to the two-yard line. Next play, we scored and, and won the first-round playoff game because uh, the quarterback talked to the running back and I tagged the flash part to it um, because he was coached up during the season and given them the ability to do that. Um, this was Justin White. It was a great running back and uh, receiver for us. How about you sprint out? Basically, I had two. I call them big waggle. When I first came to Hermitage, everybody said I called them backwards. I call them backwards. I don't know. I call them the way I want them. Uh, very simple. Um, I'll do it at trips first, and then we'll do it at a uh, at a flex. Okay, simple boot. Five yard, twelve yards. Post corner. Um, I would I would like to almost push us to 15 because these guys get too tight for the read. Um, if it's boot, our running backs just blocking the DN right here, helping with the DN so we can get a simple sprint out, roll out there. To me, that was boot. Backside, we just run a post. We weren't doing much anything with that, except for if we saw that they weren't covering it, then we come back and we tell the quarterback, uh, hit the backside post, which means he would take three steps, pull up, and throw it. But that would be on a coaching point, seeing that, calling it. He can never do that on his own. Uh, so this is a straight sprint out. Uh, way I'll coach quarter, quarterbacks here. I'll give them a count. One, two, three. One, two, three means the ball's got to be out and you're throwing this. If you're not throwing the five-yard flat, four or five is when the ball should be coming here. If you get the five, you haven't thrown it, then you look for the post corner or you're running. So it's one, two, three. I expect the ball to be out when they hit the three. Four or five means we're throwing there. And then, then that way you can drill this play without wearing out your receivers. You can have uh, – Person standing there, a person standing there, and a person standing there, and you can run this drill. You can say one, two, three, uh, and the ball's out here. And this guy would raise his hand, four, five, he'd raise his hand, or after five, this guy raises his hand, and he's got to go through his read progressions with his eyes to hit those. Uh, that's, just, that's what we would call boot. Uh, and then waggle was our play action, which was very big for us. If you if you had us uh, third and eight, uh, if we were going to run a play action, this is probably the one we'd call. And I like this more to flex. 
You got a comment here, Coach, from uh, Richard Anderson. It's, I think it's Kyle Anderson. It's, uh, one of my friends growing up. He said, great stuff, Coach. Kane, he went to Bird, Coach. Graduated in 1986. All right, so Waggle, we would actually – this is actually true play action. So we're faking the zone here. Fake it, and then um, – once he fakes his zone, then he's doing what I, I would call it a question mark uh, rotation. So I'm faking the zone, zone left, boom. So I'm coming out, I'm doing a question mark pull to get my depth because I want to throw the comeback here on the sideline. Uh, so we would push it 12 yard push to catch the ball 10. The ball should be thrown on the sideline going out of bounds. So there's not going to be any run after this. We're trying to get it. So if it was, you know, if the first down marker was not eight yards, we're catching the ball at 10, there's toe touching and we're getting out of bounds. And his job was to throw this ball when he sees the receiver break down to make his turn because the ball has to be out. So receiver, the ball, the receiver's got to find the ball in the air. He cannot wait till he already makes his break because then the corner already sees him make his break and that two guys are fighting for the ball. So we were co he was coached up to throw it when he sees the receiver squat to make his break to come for his comeback, the ball should be out to that spot, to 10 yards on the sideline. So we would drill it so he have to throw it. Uh, um, when he sees the bend, ball out, coming downhill. That's why this is more of a question mark pull because he has to get depth so he can come downhill to throw the ball. It's tough to sprint this way and throw that one. So we would call this a question mark so he gets some depth so he can come downhill to throw the ball. It takes time to run this. So there's no need to be in a hurry. Make a nice fake here. Uh, do your question mark pull, come downhill, boom. Okay. Um, we can do this. Trips to the side, to the single receiver side is fine. If we were here uh, with this, we would do. We would have him sink in and come back out, but he can't get past the hash because we don't get him in the window. So if he's here, we would do sink in and come back out and settle as a throwback here. But I really like the trips over here, waggle over here to the single receiver side, so it's no clear and we're we're stoning this ball all day long. He's either throwing that or he's not, uh, but it's. Impossible to defend. Seven on seven, they could defend it because you got all the bodies and no one's worried about the run. But 98% of the time, he should throw that comeback. And he's still in the only time he'll get in trouble is if he's waiting to go to make a break. He's got to throw it when he's bent down. So that was our that was our waggle play out of that. Is the O-line on that? Are they blocking zone? Are you leaving that backside defense men on block? They're blocking this one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh screens. Now, off of this, we would have our flash, which was a great red zone play. Because this is a great red zone play because you throw it to the front corner of the pylon. You get a spot you're throwing the ball. It's, it's marked right there for you. But then if they're overloading this, then on the fake here, he would flatten it out and run the flash from the backside to this corner. So then we can kind of pull pull up three yards and throw it here. And if the quarterback, if the running back can catch, that's a huge play off the backside. I would do trips. I would do trip. I would do trips this way to do that to bring the whole defense over here to so the single receiver side. Mm -hmm. And we would tell the backside guy on this one, run a hard slant to clear, so he has an isolated spot to himself. Mm -hmm. Throwing the throwback flash to the running back. Uh, I know you did a running back screen. What What was your screen game? We weren't. We were really big, outside the bubbles. We weren't a big screen team at all. Uh, this. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, I just didn't. Again, it's time. But you're gonna. I believe the time you have to put yeah. into the lineman to, to practice all that. I didn't want to take away from the other stuff, so we weren't a big screen team. To the frustration of my assistant coaches. Yeah. So, I mean, was there anything else that you did that you haven't gone over so far? Well, you can. Uh, once you get the quarterback understand how to make these reads, you can do all kinds of RPOs with everything else that you're doing. And when you say RPO, a lot of these guys today, like when I first learned about RPO run pass option, I mean, that was even a term they used on bootlegs. Yes. Because the quarterback had a run pass option. He could run it or he could pass it. So like your option, your RPO is maybe different than what people talk about in the NFL because right. your quarterback is a runner. It is almost from the triple option family where the ball is being completed behind the line of scrimmage. And it's it's not either or. It's on the run and making these decisions. A lot of times it's like, look at the defense. All right, I'm going to call a run play. Or look at the defense. All right, I'm going to call a pass play. No, mm -hmm. no, no. This is you're making your reads. It becomes a run or a pass um, during the context of play, depending on what the defense does to you. Um, and everybody was always worried about, what about downfield blocking? It's not. Bubbles behind the line. Yeah. And that's what the big thing you got to tell these receivers is don't go downfield because the referee's standing right here. We're stop blocking right here. You catch the ball in front of him, he knows it's 
downfield. Uh, so we got to we would tell the bubble guy if you get there early, just stop and stand there. That's fine. You'll get the ball. The ball come to you. You can catch it and then run. Um, so like stop when he's like five yards off the sidelines. A yard, a yard deep behind. We don't want him going downfield to catch the yeah. ball. So when they they can get, they're excited about getting the ball, especially you're going motion. They might get there a little early and just stop and yeah. stand there, wait for the ball to come to you. Well, what they want to do is they want to keep running and then they get downfield and then yeah, um, then you got issues with the call there. Um, we would also, when our, the better our quarterbacks were off the bubble, we would have the bubble and instead of the outside receiver, instead of stalking, he'd run a slam. So it'd be more of a, we would kind of take the quarterback run out of that. It'd be, it'd be I'd either be giving or I'd pull and we can throw the slam off of it uh, when they're when you're trying to beat up on this. Uh, we didn't do it a lot. We probably did that, believe that maybe five times. One time it was a big one against uh, uh, Bird to knock off their three state championships in a row over at Randolph Macon. Mm -hmm. We hit a slant there on a big play to. Um, did you always ball. bubble the number two, or did the number one ever run like a little? It was always the inside guy. So if okay. it was flex, it was two. It was trips, it was three. So it's always the inside guy doing the most. You can change it up. There's no yeah. reason why you couldn't say number two do it. Uh, but that's that was our philosophy. And if it was trips, the blocking here. So if he's running the bubble, we would send this guy down on the inside backer. You don't want to. We don't block in the flat defender. So we'd have to don't go him. We would send him down and get help with the inside middle backer. Or if the, if the team was a coaching point, if the safety was a strong filler, then we, he would go and get the safety. So he would, from week to week, if the safety was purely a pass guy and he's a wuss, he won't come down now. We just go help on the middle backer, which would help when a quarterback pulls and runs the alley. That's kind of a tough block for a lineman to get him over the top. There's a little more insurance there. Uh, but it was we always did it to the inside receiver. Or the, the guy motion becomes the inside receiver. He's over there. In, in your running game, you know, other I know y'all were a big inside zone team. Did you have any call quarterback runs? Oh yeah, oh okay. yeah, oh, so yeah. Did yeah, you yeah, go yeah. to those? Uh, one of my favorites is just a simple quarterback trap. If you ever played us, and it usually worked probably seventy-five percent of the time, third and long, especially deep in our own territory. I'm gonna call a quarterback trap, which is, to me was a, which was a, a draw play. Um, we would tell him to take three steps and hit it right up the middle. Um, we just do a simple trap play out of it. Um, what did you run? Oh, so what, what did the running back do if it was quarterback trap? Uh, it was a pass play. I'm gonna motion him out. Okay. Hopefully that might influence some of these backers mm -hmm. to go out. So he's gonna swing, just like a, a lot of time, if our if our running back was not a very good blocker, we would put him in the swing. Uh, a lot of times we swing on certain pass plays, or, or we call it a bob, back over ball, where you come there, we put them in a pattern um, to kind of empty it, everybody's sinking, and then hit the trap. Mm -hmm. I love that on third and ten, deep mountain territory. Nice, safe play. If it hits, it hits big. It's interesting you say that because there's some young coaches, or even in pro football, when it's third and long early in the game, you don't have to get the first down. Sometimes – uh, coaches put the quarterback in a bad predicament and call a pass, and then it ends up being a punt, um, where it's a you know a pick. But like a coach like yourself, you're you're aware of the situation and that you're not going to put your quarterback in a bad predicament. How did you learn that? Uh, just the numbers. I'm a math teacher, and I know the numbers. The odds of getting that completion on third and long when they know you're throwing long is 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 not good. And think about it. on third and long, what are these defensive linemen doing? They're coming yeah, hard. It sets them up for what? The trap. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, the linemen love it. They get a free shot taking somebody out, even if the play's not that great. Um, it's just a higher percentage hitting the trap on third and long when everybody's bailing uh, than it is of completing the ball downfield. Um, and we were big in special teams, and we didn't have a problem punting. Usually we had a pretty good punter, so we're going to get a 35-yard uh, gain out of the punt and, and you know try next time. Yeah, that, that reminds me about your special teams. Could, uh, can you go over your pump protection and your pump block? Our pump protect well, pump block changed from game to game. That's I I was in, I would design the pump block. I would find who the weak link is on the protection, and we would overload that dude. Uh, we during our special team session, I ran the pump block where you teach the players how to do the, uh, a proper blunt block. Mm -hmm. I got I bought if you said the old Gilman snaps with the big old green Nerf ball. Yeah, I would just order the Nerf ball because they're heavier and they're bigger, and that's what we would use to snap with to block with. So we're not dislocated fingers on a football when they're trying to learn how to do it. And I was the one to teach them how to block. The way you block a punt is you cover your fingers for two reasons. Number one, 
protect the fingers. But more importantly, from my standpoint, was you're going to block the ball better here because you see guys doing that and the ball goes through it all the time. Okay. So you're going to block it here. Your eyes are on the laces of the foot when you're coming on your route to block it. So I'm looking at the punter in the laces foot. I'm not looking at the ball. The ball is moving. The ball has got to get to his foot in order to be kicked. So your eyes are on the laces of the foot, and they're taught to put their hands on the laces when the foot comes up, and then use those two hands when it hits the laces to actually push down. Why are we pushing down? Because that's just a follow through with the eyes to make sure you're really going for the foot. So I would make them, I would be the punter. I would hold my foot out and I would make them run through, put their hands on my, and push my foot to the ground. And then we would do it with a snap because you got to time it up with a snap. You can't just run through it. So we'd have a guy, we would have a snapper doing it because our snapper is doing more important things. We just have one of our scrubs or maybe a big old lineman has nothing to do during a special team session to snap me the ball, either snap it real or just throw it to me so they can time it up. And we would do our drill that way. Um, you got to give something up in doing that. So we would only have a single return back there. We wouldn't be looking for big returns. So we wouldn't have our protector because I don't want the numbers up front to get the odds to get the block. So we'd always have a single receiver without our protector uh, catching a punt. So he was called, told, hey, this is sketchy. We're fair catching, fair catching, fair catching. Only catch it clean is if you're okay. Um, so we'd give up a little bit on the punt return side, although we had a lot of punt returns for touchdowns. Um, to make sure we overload for the punt block stuff. So punt block would change from week to week. And on the really good teams, I had some really smart kids. Um, we would say, here's A or B. We're going to try it here first, overload here. If it doesn't seem to be working, you guys, during the course of the game, shift over here and try it at this spot. And if you see this guy's not too strong, we'll overload here. And I let them make that adjustment. One person would be assigned the block. That's the other thing. We don't have 10 people going for the block. That's when you get the collisions and you run through yeah. the punter. Uh, so one person's the block guy. And it's a read on the run. So let's say we're just coming off the edge here. Um, we're always trying to double team some. Let's say this guy, his rule is the block down. So we got two coming off the edge and you got one protector here. His job is to run to the inside foot. His job is to run to the outside foot. If he blocks him, he's going to pull up and stay there because he knows his teammate is the blocker. If he blocks out here and blocks him, he's going to pull up, not fight through it, just take the collision and stop, and he's the free runner. So we always had an overload, so we're going to have a free runner and go through the pass. We don't have two guys going in, then you get the rough the punter. Um, rarely had roughing the punter calls. Uh, it was because well, one guy's supposed to be blocking it. Did that Correct. guy – Go every time? Did you these guys are going every time because you never know which way this guy's going to go. Even yeah, if he's well, coached the block a certain way. So these would be my two guys, my two blockers. Okay. Depending on which one got picked off, the other one would be free. Now, that could be a gap. We could be doing that a gap. You know, or it could be outside, depending on where the weak link was. Um, we're, we're trying to get a two-on-one somewhere, according to your protection. And then uh, wherever that two-on-one is, whoever the free person is coming through, we'd have an idea who we thought would be free, but you never know. Uh, and I had my best guy doing that. And if it's a bad snap, you always got two guys going back there, too. Well, that's, the, that's the other thing. So he's coming through for the block. We, one guy on this side, we call him my scoop and score guy. So he'd be coming through if this ball is blocked. And then the other free man on the outside here, he's he's looking for the scoop and score. Because if you get the block, you're probably not going to see the ball. Yeah, the next guy's going to get in this. I've never thought of that. So him or him who got picked up will be looking for the scoop and score. Yes, so, so your, your, your punt team – I remember you used three on each side. You had two uh, up backs, and you had a flanker. You know, I guess he went to the field. Um, how did you do that? Did you count it out, or what was the rules like? On protection? Mm-hmm. Like, let's say Highland Springs was up there, and they put yeah, they they five guys protection. on each side, you know, and a, and a deep guy. Uh, we just counted off. Um. He's going to have number one. He's going to have number two. He's going to have number three. So if you put all these guys up, so if you put yes, your overload yeah. here, one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, his job is to kick to get number one. His job is to kick to get number two. His job is to kick number three. His job at five yards off would step up one jab, just make sure there's no free runner, and then he's coming out to get number four and kick number four out. If five came on the edge, we would time our snap to make sure it snaps off in time. That's a job for the center and the punter to get the ball off on time because five shouldn't be able to get there in time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to shore up the inside. Our snappers had zero block responsibility. They are just snapping. Um, 
Our third string snapper was always one of our backup quarterbacks. So you're probably not going to have three snappers, but you better have three snappers because there's one game in my 17 years we had to play our third string snapper in the second half. Yeah. Um, uh, so we would just make that a quarterback because all you got to do is stand there and throw a pass exactly. to get the ball back there. So our third string was usually usually a quarterback, a backup quarterback. But we'd have two snappers. So you know, with, with with doing the flanker, you know, you're guaranteed that the most you could have is five on one side. I mean, I guess five and four. And then with we would put him to the wide side. Uh, because our when we punt, we were we were not just punting. We we were punting for spots. Um if we are on the right hash, the ball is gonna go out on the right hash. We are not kicking to the field, let these guys run. His job was to get the ball 30, 25 yards, whatever. He is aiming for the sideline to get the ball on the sideline. So if we're kicking, if we're on the right hash, he'd be on the wide side. Again, because if he does, ball doesn't get out of bounds, he's going to be coming up here to help. He's like the safety on the side in case this ball goes wide, which is the dangerous part for the ball to go to. When we kick the ball, these guys are spreading. Uh, if I can remember correctly, the tight end, which was this guy, his job was to get to the numbers. His job was to get to the hash. His job was to get to the goal post, dead center, goal post, uh, hash, numbers. numbers. At 10 yards from where the ball was, they should be at that spot. And then if the ball is kicked over here, then, then you can start betting. That gives us a fan to cover the field in case there's a reverse or something else. But you also want to converge the ball. So at 10 point, when you run through this spot, you get there, we can see you're covered. Then you're just going to bend to the ball. That kind of gives us a good coverage. Um, and these two guys are the safeties with the punter, which, you know, we usually don't want to count on him making too many tackles. Mm -hmm. That's how we did our protection. So when you went from being head coach at Hermitage to when you took some time off, I believe, then you became the offensive coordinator, right, at King William. Correct. What, what did you change? when you went from Hermitage to King William, or did you keep everything the same? Well, I just did the offense. I, I didn't – I was in charge of special teams. Coach Moore did a great job being head coach, doing his, putting his twist to his stuff. Uh, but I was just calling the offense and coached the quarterbacks. And you ran all the same stuff? Yep. There was nothing new, nothing that you tweaked? Mm -hmm. We did our stuff. Uh, what's different was they did it. They had a band system. Mm -hmm. We would signal in our plays. They yeah. would do it off a band system to call the plays. So how did you call your plays at Hermitage? Did you just – did the quarterback come over to you? Uh, we had a couple of things. No, we would signal in. Uh, receiver coach would signal in the formation, uh, which would be first because they'd be we want to be a fast-paced offense, and we would be running to our formation. And then I would signal in the, the pass. There was a signal and pass or run, and then a number. Okay. Uh, like th three could be 33 zone or it could be 303 pass. Yeah. So we would yell three. So, but you don't know what three minutes run or a pass if you were trying to pick up on our numbers. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, and then there was a signal with, which would tell them, or if the run version of three or the pass version of three. Yeah. Um, which made it very good for two minute offense because then you just yell the numbers and it's, it's what they do already. It's nothing new to learn. You always went fast. How about if you had to slow it down? Did you ever have to slow it down? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It? Four minute offense, we're going to do um, just slow it down. We would tell, you know, guys just chill. We'd be here. And then, like, if we were trying to do the 30 second clock, you know, we're trying to wear it down and snap with five seconds, we'd be here. We say hold, then I'd go like this. That means there's six seconds. You can, and go, you can get play snap in six seconds. So we would look at the clock, get snap in six seconds, boom, call it, go. They yeah. already knew what the play was. Then they'd run it. And that's how you. That was bad on that. I was always fired up and going, going. The coach said, run me, coach, you want to slow down now? Coach, you want to slow down? And that was yeah. good to have systems to keep you in check there in those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so many. Uh, high school coaches out there, and I don't know how much high school football you watch, but from all your years in it, what do you think is something that high school coaches could do better? Do they do too much? Do you have? Do they need to pick an identity? What? Well, from an offense standpoint, uh, you're not offense coordinator unless you understand line play. To think you can call plays, and I'm not, and that was my advantage. I was a line guy all along. I coached quarterbacks, you know. I became a quarterback coach. I had a need in my staff because I didn't have one. Um, and uh, it turned out to be the right thing to do because you want that relationship with your quarterback. Uh, but you have to know line play, and you got to keep it simple on your line. Changing blocking schemes every week is killing you. Yeah. Have one thing you do, do it very well, and then do the shell game with the receivers and everything else off of that. Uh, keep it simple on those guys. That's why I don't like having a tight end in my offense because that made my tackle learn 
how what's my scheme when I have a tight end on my side? What's my scheme when I don't? It's different. Um, in college, what we got around that, my Stokely Fulton at Ham City, we would flip the whole offensive line. We had a tight end side that would go right and left, yeah. and then they called the quick side. You know, it was just the guard and tackle didn't have it. And that's how it made it simple for them because you had the same scheme. You just They would just tell you what side of the ball to go to to keep it simplified that way. Uh, for me, from my standpoint, is I, that's why I was opposed to tight end. I mean, I love the H-back. Now I can move that guy around and put him on right and left and, and put him in motion and use him to come inside on an ISO, create an ISO play with the H-back, and I'm not screwing with these guys' rules. Mm-hmm. So keep it simple on the front five uh, so they can do the work that they got to do. They have the hardest job, uh, and it's the most important job. Uh, and so realize whenever you put something in, if it's complicating things for your alignment, then you probably shouldn't be putting it in. Would be my two cents on that. So you hung your hat on the zone game. You didn't do it much Correct. gap scheme. You ran a trap. No, we ran a trap. We, had, we did an iso play um, where we would motion uh, an ace back type guy or even a receiver to come in and lead. Or we do a quarterback iso yeah. where a back can go and lead up for him. Uh, so we had those plays in there because you need some short yard stuff too. Uh, out, inside zone, outside zone. I loved outside zone on the short side. Mm-hmm. I kind of got this from – Respect to my bird people. They would like to run to the short side a lot. Um, from what they did, and I learned to love, if this is the hash, short side of the field, so over here at the wide side, I would love putting trips to the short side of the field for two things. Number one, if we had to stud over there, the shit in your pants, you guys, it's got a lot of space in one-on-one. You can try to cover that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to got my slant and my fade game all day long. And number two, most teams aren't going to shift their whole defense on the short side of the field to cover this. So now I have you outnumbered over here because you have to feel like you're balanced over here. And we got the numbers here for the outside zone. Boom, boom, boom. Reading the tackle here uh, on our outside zone. So I would love running outside zone to trips to the short side. Um, and later in the game, later in my years, we did what we called a uh, – we did a lot of bunch stuff. To the short side as well. What we call this, this is what we call bunch, and then shift the bunch. So you set your defense here, we say shift these two guys that go over here, then you run the play on a quick snap, mm-hmm. and just so you go from the short side. Now we're bang, bang the short side. Now we say shift, you come over here, and now we're going wide side with it, and got the numbers over there. And, um, and a lot of these college guys, they call that formation into the boundary, they because they set their defense. Well, high school is different. We get realize we have a shorter, yeah, than really than the cop. So trouble. We yeah. So we got a bigger advantage. I feel than and then the NFL. They're all playing damn middle field anyway. There's no sense to doing it. Mm-hmm. But at the high school level, with our wider hashes, bigger advantage. Take advantage of it. I mean, you know, so quite simple. Play. You do all this, quarterback sweep, runner, runner. You got all these numbers on the freaking sideline. You, you yeah. get three or four yards pretty good that way. Oh yeah. Know? Um, so take advantage of the short side of the field. And then with the threat over here, if you coach your quarterback up and we know all the space over here, they're cramping over here, you got to slant or fade easy, well, I'm going to check off and throw that. Anything else you'd like to say to the clinic coach before before we sign off? And th- this uh, this episode has been brought to you by um, Kane Realtors, um, Hometown Realty. We appreciate their support. Coach, anything else you'd like to say to the clinic? We appreciate you coming today. Yeah, if you're an RBA, you want to talk ball, I'll be glad to talk ball to anybody. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, uh, you know, uh, you want, you know, a lot of guys doing stuff in all season. You want to, if you want to implement some stuff in the other Richmond area, I'd be glad to do it. Uh, only, only thing I would ask in return is Kane Family Realtors, 804-840-4498. Uh, you know, be willing to tell people – I'm your guy. We're your guy. Coaches helping coaches. Um, I'll help you out. You help us out so I can pay for my three daughters' college education. We're all good. <laughs> Thank you, Coach, for coming on. Yeah, it's great. Love talking ball. We'll have you back, Coach. Thank you.